All right, so in this video, you're gonna learn about the power of wisdom and the power of experience and why it's so important. Because as they say, a smart man will learn from his own mistake and a wise man will learn from the smart man and never make that mistake. All right, so I want to talk about this quick story, all right, so from yesterday and uh, uh, what, what happened. So if you've been following the journey of uh, this year, especially 2017, um, we're in a phase of rebuilding a company because the company that I've used to previously have fell and collapsed on itself when not too couple of uh, years ago we, we would do easily over $60 million in real estate sales and um, we would actually rev out over seven figures. So as I'm back in it um, now, unloading a lot of the baggage I had and uh, rebuilding from scratch, uh, having tons of fun, but also at the same time, um, I think wisdom and experience really comes into place um, because number one, it's not my second road. Literally, this is like my third go around of trying to build a company, right? So, um, as a matter of fact, I probably have uh, <laughs> uh, took more than over probably 10 different uh, little mini companies, okay, uh, to the ground. So, hopefully, this one's going to be a sticker, right? So, <laughs> um, so here's what happened. So, around uh, four. Uh, PM, I want to say yesterday, uh, a little past 4 p.m. I get a call uh, from uh, one of our team members, and uh, he's and you can tell already in his tonality that something happened. And I don't know if you ever had those type of calls, right, where someone calls you and uh, you know because you've worked with them or you know them personally as well, is that hey, there's a little shift in their voice, right, a little agitation, and he basically says, hey Jeff got a question for you. Do you know this particular person? Because he said that he knows you. And I was like, yeah, I know him. And, and I was like, dude, you should know him too. Remember, uh, you know, we've, we've had some drinks together and, and when we used to throw events, right? He would come around with his crew and we would hang out. And then he was just like, yeah, so is he legit? And I was just like, well, I think he's legit, you know, but I'll be up front. I was like, dude, I've never closed a single deal with this guy. And I've closed a deal with a lot of people. And he said, well, let me tell you what's going on with this deal. So he tells me about this deal. Um, and he says, yeah, man, um, we just sent the counter yesterday. And I was like, okay, cool, so what's the problem? And then he says, yeah, um, I picked up the phone and I called him and I asked the guy, it says, uh, well, what are you trying to do? You know, be upfront with me. Are you gonna try to wholesale this deal? And the reason why he said that he asked them is because the escrow company that currently was about to open escrow basically told them that says, hey, you know, you need to watch out for this guy because this guy never actually performs on his contract, all right? And uh, to simultaneously, this escrow company has another deal with this guy that's in and he says he's reneged on his contract and trying to back out. All right, now, if, it, if anyone has been in the wholesale game especially if you're new, it might not apply to you, but if you have, you know there are certain times and places where you have to back out, okay? There is, all right? You just have to back out, okay? So I'm a firm believer, if you do enough deals, there's no one in the wholesale game or in the investment world that they're swinging, so they're swinging 100 for 100. There's absolutely none, all right? That's why there's contingency plans. That's why there's certain things where you got, you, you know, you have to go back out and or ask for reduction, right? You just can't swing 100 for 100, all right? But this escrow company that he has a relationship with basically literally on him, basically said, no, nah, this guy's a thing. And then the escrow company basically told him, yeah, the other company that he made an offer on, the company is no longer even active anymore, right? So he's throwing all this kind of stuff at him. So that's why he decided to just pick up the phone and call this particular buyer because it's a listing, right, that he has. And it is kind of a fixture developer deal, right? So he hits him up and uh, asked him a question, said, hey man, like, what are you trying to do? You know, are you trying to wholesale this or to someone else? And if you are, just be upfront. And uh, what he told me was he became very defensive. He says, if you don't like the way that I'm operating, then hey, let's not do business together or something like that. And, and then don't ask for that, you know, because he's obviously the gatekeeper, right? So he's doing his job and uh, I don't know why he would get upset on the other side other than the fact that you know, was he just shocked that someone was questioning his business model? I don't know, okay? I really don't know. Maybe it was just a bad day, who knows, right? Because we all have bad days. Um, but 
just because you have a bad day doesn't make it right to, uh, you know, go off on someone, whatever it is, okay? Now, clearly, there was some miscommunication, right? So he hits me up. He's talking. We're having this conversation. I say, look, I've never closed a deal with this guy. I don't know. Um, I, I, don't even, I haven't even talked to him probably for a year or so. Um, but I do know from uh, word on the street some of the stuff that, you know, the history of what, what has happened. Why? It's because people who do stuff in Southern California, they talk, you know? And I don't even know if I should publicly be saying a lot of this stuff, but I think it's a good learning experience to know how small the actual community is right the community that we're part of in this real estate world this real estate investment community okay it doesn't even matter whatever community you're part of okay um, that really people that are movers and shakers right they have certain alliances and they have relationships with people and people talk it's just the way it is, all right? And so you have to be really careful of what you say, but more of you just gotta do good business, right? It's kind of, and I know I've seen, I've seen like I'm like preaching, which is sometimes seems like it's common sense, right? It's to just say, hey, do good business and then good things will happen. And sometimes doing the good thing, it might be really, seem maybe really difficult, but that's the only thing in my opinion, okay? So the escrow company has absolutely no faith in this particular person, clearly, so I get involved. And I was like, all right, let me uh, call him up and because uh, I have his number. So I called him, you know, he texts me back and just says, hey, please text. You know, I was like, all right, cool. So I say, hey, this is Jeff Koga. I was like, Jeff Koga, just want to check in, see how you're doing. And then uh, um, immediately he messages me. I think he says something like, what's up? You know, hey, let's make some money together. And I'm just like, oh, man, uh, man, this is, a, this is a rough situation already. Right? Especially when someone like starts off like you haven't talked in a long time and their first response is let's make some money together. Right? I already know we're gonna go down a bad rabbit hole, you know, versus like, hey, how you doing? You know, like, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm not a guy that likes to do like small talk and stuff like that, but usually that's not the first thing I actually hit people up with, like, hey man, let's make some money. Unless you have like that type of relationship with the person, okay, that's cool, but I never had that type of relationship with that person. Why? Because we never closed a deal together, right? So he has that, and uh, right when he texted me that, I just said, you know what, screw it, and I just picked up the phone, dialed his number, called him, and he answered. So how's things going on? You know, it was just like, I was like, same old, same old. There's nothing that's changed with my business, you know, which is, hey, go look for uh, underperforming assets simultaneously, teach, uh, teach people how to actually do the exact same thing and uh, prepare myself for the next correction in the market. Then he tells me that, yeah, you know, um, I stopped doing the rehabs and development deals, you know, um, so I'm just focused on wholesaling right now. And uh, I have a really, really great buyer in Irvine, this particular hedge fund. And uh, they're, literally, they're doing like 40 transactions a month. I'm just like, for reals? There's a hedge fund in Irvine that's doing 40 plus transactions a month? So you're telling me they're doing 40 transactions a month times 12 if they're actually doing that on a 12-month period. So I'm running this math in my head, right? 480 transaction. I'm just like 480 transaction. I'm just like, huh, in Irvine, right? So I, that's easy. I can just go to public records and pull it up and see what entity actually has over 400 transactions. Unless the, this hedge fund has multiple, multiple uh, buying entities, but which is highly unlikely. Why? Because if they are a hedge fund and truly raise money on, they're going to buy under, under one entity. Otherwise, it's going to be an accounting nightmare. Okay? So this is where like experience and wisdom comes in, right? So I'm listening. I'm like, okay. And then he was just like, yeah. And these, uh, these, the, these guys, they don't really care too much about returns that you know, like you and I, we have to get. You know, they are they're okay with getting like six percent, eight percent returns at the end. Um, you know, maybe sometimes 10 or 12 and I was like, oh, okay. And I was like, is that, is that annualized return? And he said, no, 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 no. That's for transaction wise, right? Transaction wise. All right. And when you start hearing this, this is again, going back to experience and wisdom where you start picking up is if you know the game, right? A lot of people that are even professional investors getting a annualized return on cash on cash money, right? Unleveraged debt over 20% return in a year, meaning that you're turning the money over. Let's just say if you're doing like six months, right? You get a 10% return. If you do it twice in a year, that means that you're getting what? Annualized return of 20% plus, all right? That's really tough. I'm being straight up, okay? It's really tough to do that at scale. All right now can you do that as one man operation stuff right and you do like four deals in a year five deals in a year yeah you can probably if you're really really good all right like borderline great you can do that 
all right? Unleveraged debt, you can do that. Now, if it's leveraged debt, yeah, because your numbers are gonna be a little bit more skewed because because, because the fact that you're using the debt, right? But if it's unleveraged debt, it's really, really tough, especially in like Southern California, to do that. So I'm asking this, he's like, oh, okay. And then I was like, so per transaction? And I was like, oh, okay. And then I was like, what kind of deals? Like, are they doing additions on new construction home? Which I already knew that they're not doing that at that type of return. He's like, no, like, you know, simple stuff. Maybe they'll do additions. So really the math is about six months and they want 8%. So they're trying to hit a, like a 6% return mark on their funds, you know, if that's the case, you know, it's, it's not, it's not difficult to do, but it's tough if you're telling me you're doing 40 transactions a month at over 400 transactions trying to do that on a blended, that is really tough. So, so when you hear that kind of stuff, you know, you have to be weary, you have to have the experience to be able to question those things, all right? But also at the same time, just be aware that you, you come off as being very, very foolish if, if you're talking like that. You know, and and I, for one, I don't like to like burst people's bubbles when we're in that kind of conversation. So I'll see, okay, you know, I'll keep on letting him talk, and I'll see how much he wants to push this. You know, so I'm talking, I'm talking, and then he says, yeah. So I got this particular other deal in this area, and I was like, you do? And this uh, particular location, it's in a uh, Rancho Palos Verdes of all places. So I know the area very well. It's under 2,000 square feet, and lot size might be like 7,500, where the usable space is about 4,000 square feet. And, and then I look it up, and I pull up the I pull it up, I Google the address, and boom, pops up, and I was pretty damn close to that, right? So um, that's, again, experience and wisdom, where if you know your area, right, and you do something over and over, boom, you know, it's that sixth sense that pops up, all right? And, you know, I, I talk about it a lot where, where people talk, you know, it's actually Malcolm Gladwell says it in the tipping point, right, which is the 10,000 hours, right? You do something over 10,000 hours, you gain that experience, that hunch, and he talks about it even more in the second book that he wrote called Blink, uh, where you have that gut feeling, right? And... Uh, so we're having this conversation about this deal. And then uh, he was like, yeah, so I got four or five other of these. You want to check these out? And I said, look, I said, you can send it to me if you think that it's a great deal. Um, if it's if it's a marginal good deal, then I was just like, unless it's in an area that has, you know, some upsides for developers or something like that. I said, I'm not, I don't, I don't want to see it because I don't want to get involved in a deal where the spread is like $5,000 that we can make together. And I was like, look, I'm not trying to be all snobbish or anything. But I said, hey, the slim deals are the most difficult ones to get involved on because, uh, you know, if people want to get a reduction or something like that, there's no room to wiggle. Then we have to go back with the seller or the agent or whoever that's involved, and then we have to have them go renegotiate, and there's a lot of moving parts to it, and I just simply don't want to be part of it, you know? So kind of the rule of thumb is, like, unless it has, like, $20,000 plus, I just don't want to get involved on it, right? And then he's like, well, there is, you know, hey, you can put twenty grand on there, and then we can split it 50-50, you know, kind of deal. That's what he said. And I'm just like, okay, he's not getting it. And uh, I can already sense in the fact that he just wants to make money, right? And maybe that's how he's perceiving me is that I'm just a dude that just want to make money. Maybe that's why he's talking about me, right? As they say, right? Sometimes how the world looks at you is a direct, you know, how you portray to the outside world and who you are, right? So I don't know. Maybe that's what I'll care about. But literally, I'm sensing it over the phone. I'm talking like something ain't right. I know he split up with his partner. And I know uh, I know uh, when it comes to splitting up with partners, there's only two reasons why people split up with business partners. Number one, they didn't make any money. All right. If they didn't make any money, cool. Um, they're typically still friends, all right? Or the second reason people split up in business partner is someone got screwed for their money. They made money, but someone got screwed. And if they do that, typically they don't like each other, all right? <laughs> and, and that's it. And from my experience, that's that's all I know. And I learned this from again my mentor. He used to say that all the time. He said like you can figure out really quickly on what happened with their previous business experience. If they're still friends, that means they didn't make any money. If they're not friends, then they're fighting over money. He said, and is there something in between? He's like, yeah, uh, but those are actually uh, anomalies. That's what he would say, you know, which is so true. I'm a firm believer on that. So I'm talking to him. I can sense that he needs money or he wants to do deals or close deals because that's the first thing on his mind. And then I hit him with the punchline. I was like, I'll take a look. And I said, um, you lock in a buyer yet? And I purposely said it that way. He's like, no, 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 uh, no, I haven't yet. How'd you know about that? And he's all like, I'm plugged in with the community, you know, and I control at least like 40 plus transactions of, uh, you know, leads that were people that were talking to or people were working with. And I control that at least on any given, uh, any given month. And so I know, um, and he's like, Oh no, no, it's not taken yet. But if you're interested, Hey, you know what? Well, we can write that offer up. So this is what happened right when he said that is that he presumed that I wanted to buy that property. This is a classic move on wholesalers, right? Bottom line is we ended the call and uh, bottom line is he doesn't have a buyer, all right? It's not locked in, it's not solid and uh, you know, something ain't right.
is not right, you know, especially in the fact that, you know, um, yeah, especially in the fact that, um, you know, the first thing out of their mouth is just money, 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 you know. So, again, I have absolutely no problem with that. Again, going back to that experience, that gut feeling, you just have to sometimes draw the line in the sand and be like, hey, this is it. And that's kind of the same thing I told my guy. This is where, again, going into understanding timeline, understanding contract really comes into place is because he needs to be putting in his deposit and stuff like that. And the other thing is, you know, there's other strategies to making sure that you protect yourself if you're like the listing agent or if you're wholesaling, right, which is uh, you do a release of deposit. All right, because because in California, it's a quirky law that they have that if you, the deposit comes in from a third party entity that's not on the contract, that deposit doesn't get incorporated directly into the transaction, meaning that escrow company does not legally have the right to incorporate a deposit that didn't come from the purchaser's contract name. Now, there are a lot of escrow companies and escrow officers that are not aware of that. All right. There's tons and tons of those. All right. So it's kind of a loophole in a gray area where literally you can remove contingencies on an offer, right, in the state of California um, because we have something called a bilateral agreement or contract, right, which is you need both, both sides of the contracts to actually be signed off. So it's a consumer-friendly state. Okay, so which is beneficial, but also at the same time, it's quirky. Okay, so so if you're an investor and you're a sophisticated investor, even a sophisticated retail buyer, if you're aware of this, right, you can write offers um, on properties, removing contingencies, just remove them 100 percent. Right. Just make sure that your deposit that you come in isn't on contract with the purchase contract. And if it's not, technically, that deposit is not part of the actual uh, uh, transaction. And if you want to back out, you can just contact the escrow company and be like, hey, by the way, can I get my deposit back? And they'll be like, no, it's part of the contract. And I'll be like, uh, how is it part of the contract? It's not. Look at the contract. The wire came from X, Y and Z. But the purchase contract is from uh, ABC. It's not supposed to be part of it. I never signed a third party deposit. And that's how you literally unwind the whole transaction, right? So um, so that's kind of part of the, the sneaking game that no one talks about. And if you like that, let me leave a comment below, you know? So here's a trick what I recommend uh, some other investors or if you're new, if you want to protect yourself, right? Is this, is this is a very popular real estate world, okay? So a lot of the stuff I learned from the commercial world and I apply it in the residential area, right? And it throws people off because they're like, damn, I've never seen like this, right? So in California, if you want to protect yourself as you being the seller, as a wholesaler or actual seller, right? The the total dollar amount of the deposit, okay, meaning like people want like sometimes higher deposit, right? They'll be like, I want a 10% deposit, I want a 20% deposit, or whatever it is, right? The total higher amount of deposit, it's irrelevant. Like I, I tell people all the time, I said, look, dude, like you can, you can have someone put in 50 grand, you can have someone put in 10 grand, you can put, have someone put in 100 grand. But if that person who put in that deposit is smart and they structure that deposit in a way where where that deposit is legally not at risk, but because of the inexperience and wisdom that whoever maybe you have or the agent that's representing you have and they're not aware of it, then that deposit is never at risk. All right. So the way to count fight this is don't focus on the higher deposit amount. Is a high deposit amount good to show like, hey, they, they really want it? Yes, 100%. But what will really prove that, hey, they know their stuff and or they really want it is to have a clause in there to release the deposit immediately on acceptance, okay? Or after inspection period is over, all right? It has a, it's literally, it's a pass-through type of deal where you have it in the contract says, hey, you know what? You got a five-day inspection period. After the sixth day, we're gonna go and release the deposit to the seller. You as the wholesaler, so you get the deposit, right? So escrow sends you the deposit and or the seller, if you're selling the house, you get the deposit, all right? Now, if they bitch and moan not wanting to do that, all right, now I'm not gonna teach on this this uh, this episode or this show, whatever you're watching this, how to actually sell it because there's a way to set it up to sell it like that, right? To basically have them say okay and you can find out if they're really serious or not. But if they say no to it, the next move after that is just saying, okay, well, I understand that. Well, let's go ahead and both take on a risk together. How's that sound? And they'll be like, okay, what do you mean? And be like, well, let's go ahead and say, hey, your deposit is 10,000 and let's just say your closing date after uh, inspection period or from that day you have 10 days to close all right if they have 10 days to close then I'll be like hey let's take the risk on your side because time is of the essence on my side and also you're saying that you can close it within 10 days after contingency removal correct um, they're like uh-huh well let's take the risk together and I'll be like hey 
So if we split this up, this 10,000 in 10 different days, 10 days, that means $1,000 a day. So let's go ahead and put it on a contract. Hope you're not offended by this, that hey, $1,000 get released every single day until the close day. And by the time the close date happens, guess what? Obviously it's a deposit. So you get that deposit applied to your purchase contract and then you wire the remaining funds and you'll close it out and you'll get the amazing property. And um, you know you can start your project and get start getting amazing returns. And I can feel secure that I don't have to worry that hey, for whatever reason, something happens, you're gonna renege on your offer, all right? And then, if they're really serious, they'll say okay, all right? But that's what I mean by structuring the deal that way, is to actually literally have the deposit released to the actual you, the seller, if you're signing your contractor position, or you, the actual seller yourself. And you wanna structure it that way, because as I said, if that buyer on the other side is smart, okay, we can structure in a way that your deposit is never at risk in this beautiful sunny state of California because it's such a consumer-friendly state. Now, I don't know if that's going to work outside of California, okay, I just know my California law really, really well, so it works, okay, so, so again, you want to protect yourself and that's some ways in shape or form to actually do that versus again I can always tell who's inexperienced and who is inexperienced because the inexperienced person will just hammer on the deposit right they'll be like they'll be like hey it's a million dollar right and they'll be like you need to put down 10% deposit on this you know and then I'll be like okay no I can't do that I'm only gonna put down I'm only gonna put down 3,000 be like no that's ridiculous you know a norm is at least a minimum of 5,000 we have so much buyers so you got to actually show us commitment that you want to actually put that you really want this and if you really want this and you're a cash buyer you have to put down 10% you know they'll say stuff like that and it's just like dude like come on man and then you start grinding them down and you end up like at 3% or whatever right so so you're gonna have to put down on a million dollars 3% you're just like oh, okay man the cash flow you got to put a good chunk of money in there um, you know which is no problem if it's a great deal but again going back to is if you structure it and you know the way you can wire out your 30 grand 40 grand 50 grand 100 grand or whatever and that money will never be at risk right because I can negotiate with that person and be like, look, look, I'll remove all contingents right now and I'll actually send you, I'll send you, uh, I'll send you $10,000, right? Right? Meaning I just can't back out of it, right? We'll make sure that we'll send it out. And they'll be like, oh, okay, sure, fine, right? And if they say that, I structure in a way that my money isn't at risk. Now, I'm not saying that you should do this all the time, okay? Um, uh, again, this is a contingency asterisk. You don't go into a deal wanting to back out, all right? Because I know when sometimes when I talk about this, people will be like, oh, it's kind of like sleazy, Jeff. And I'm just like, dude, that's not what I'm saying. Um, what I'm saying is you have a backup plan that you have just in case, what I like to call when shit hits the fan contingency, okay? You have that. All right, but you never want to go into a deal knowing that you want to back out. Why, why would you want to do that? That's just a waste of your time, their time, and everyone's time. All right, so why would you again if, 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 if you can't remotely you know make it happen right in your gut? Why do it? All right, why do it? Okay, and I hope I made that clear. If I didn't make it clear earlier, that's what I mean. Okay, is please don't put a deal together if you can't you know do, you know do that and don't use this little little secret I'm giving you guys um, to purposely just go do stuff so you're just like oh I'm just gonna tie up a lot of stuff and structure it this way so my deposits never on hook okay don't do that all right but that's what I got here I don't know what time it is it's late I gotta get into the office I'm actually already here at the office so I'm gonna start rocking and working if you got value out of this one please share it with someone um, and let me know in the comments if you like this kind of stuff we're gonna be changing up a lot of the show and the, the, a lot of things in the next coming two weeks and three weeks or so on what we got going on um, and if you haven't make sure you go to um, Go to YouTube and check out Jeff Koga Live, uh, where a lot of this video, if you're watching this on uh, Facebook as live streaming this, right, I see tons of comments on here, uh, you'll at least know, hey, um, that's a place where it's a little bit more organized and you can actually watch, all right? Thank you, everyone that's watching. Take care, bye.